Good morning, everyone. My name is Pence Tanai, and as a partner of Kellen WMG, hard to say sometimes, and leader of the Latin American Initiative, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our Opportunities in Colombia Update 2017, Infrastructure Development in Smart Cities. It is organized by our close friends of the Canada Columbia Chamber of Investment of Trade. Um, we have a very interesting event today. We have a full agenda. First of all, we're very excited to have again with us our keynote speaker, the Colombian Ambassador to Canada, the Honorable Nicolas Lloreda. Bienvenido, embajador. Uh, we will then hear about social infrastructure and smart cities opportunities in Bogota from Juan Gabriel Perez and Juan Carlos Jimenez from Invest Bogota. Invest Bogota is the investment promotion agency for Bogota, an initiative of the Chamber of Commerce of Bogota and the city government of Bogota. And finally, we're going to hear about experiences doing business in Colombia, particularly the infrastructure sector, and from a very, very interesting panel. So I'm going to pass the word to Andres Tivino, President of the Canadian Colombian Chamber of Investment and Trade. He will provide the opening remarks. Thank you, friends. His Excellency, Gurbajreda, Ambassador of Colombia to Canada, Cristina Pastrana, Consul General of Colombia in Toronto, Alvaro Concha, Trade Commissioner of Colombia in Canada, Guillermo Heras, Trade Commissioner and Info Centre Manager of Global Affairs Canada, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andres Trevino, and I'm the President of the Canada Colombia Chamber of Investment and Trade. We are an independent organization that was created here in Canada to promote business relations between the two countries. Among the industries that we promote, we have energy, infrastructure, mining, oil and gas, smart cities, clean tech, and social initiatives. I want to thank Ambassador Nicolás Lloreda for accepting our invitation. Juan Gabriel Pérez from the Place in Bogotá, thank you for accepting the invitation as well. I want to thank our panel, Jan Sebastián, Tori, Carl, Juan. Thank you for accepting the invitation. I want to thank Alins for hosting this event. I want to thank our partners, Pro Colombia and Global Affairs, and our sponsors, EDC, KPMG, Scotiabank, U308 Corp, and Copa Airline, which I actually use very often, and I like very much. Good connections, by the way. I'm pleased to introduce His Excellency, Nicolás Llorena Ricaut, Ambassador of Colombia to Canada. Ambassador Jureda has brought vast international experience to this role, based on a career that combines an impressive path of representing the Colombian government abroad with an outstanding practice in international corporate law. Proud to his current post, he proudly represented Colombia as Deputy Chief of Mission for the Colombian Embassy in Washington, a city that also witnesses success in practicing law at Sydney and Austin and Cole and Murray. Prior to moving to DC, he served as General Director of the Andean Community Free Trade Zone. Finally, I would like to mention that in 2010, the Colombian government appointed him as mediator before the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. Without further delays, I invite you to please welcome Ambassador Jerez Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, coming this morning on uh, this beautiful day um, and enjoying some Colombian coffee. I'm sure it's Colombian, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and I want to thank Andres Trivino uh, and Gowlings for setting this up. Uh, I'm trying, I will try to be brief because we have a wonderful panel uh, afterwards and I want to learn from all these money makers uh, what's really happening. Um, but um, let me, um, I, I, I prepared a presentation uh, and I divided it in four basic subjects. I want to start with my um, Columbia 101. Uh, there's always people in the audience that know more about Columbia than I do, but sometimes there is somebody that maybe um, is not as focused and, and maybe they get something out of uh, an explanation as the way uh, the government sees what's happening. Talk a little bit about the peace accord. There's always a couple questions on, on what's happening in the peace accord, and then the bilateral relationship and opportunities on infrastructure. 
So, um, I, I always, with my presentations, regardless of the subject, I was in Quebec last week and, and in Montreal doing different presentations on not infrastructure, but cooperatives and, and social stuff. But I like also to begin whatever presentation with this chart because I think that, uh, I, unfortunately, I have, unless you have really good vision, I doubt that you can read what it says there. I know I couldn't. But uh, let me it's, it's try to compare a little bit uh, the Columbia 50 years ago to the Columbia today. And uh, one of the things that has happened in many countries, including Colombia, is that 50 years ago we were mostly a rural country. More than half, almost 70% <coughs> of Colombians lived in the rural areas, whereas now maybe 20% of all Colombians live in the rural areas. So that's, that's a big change. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, all the main indicators of human development um, have really risen, uh, and there's huge differences to what Colombia was 50 years ago uh, when the conflict with FARC and with many of the uh, guerrilla groups uh, began. Uh, infant mortality, the increase of life expectancy at birth, reduction of poverty are all numbers that if you see uh, in Colombia 98% of people have health care coverage. Just in 1993, it was 25%. Um, education, literacy rate back then was 60%, now it's 99%. Uh, access to higher education, number of um, people graduating from high school or college every year has uh, multiplied significantly um, uh, since then. Um, another another thing, the chart that I like to use um, for you to take an idea, this one goes just to 1991. So uh, we're talking about what Colombia looked like and what Colombia looked like since 2000, since 1810 when we became a country. You know, Canada is turning 150 this Saturday. Uh, we are 206 years old uh, and it was not until uh, the year 2012 that Colombia largest group of population was middle class so it took us 200 years to become a country with a middle class that would be the stronger uh, group um, but you see throughout these years it was really a country of extreme poverty a very small elite uh, and, a, and a middle class that wasn't even uh, third so uh, this change brings a lot of, um, of, of uh, things that happen in Colombia that are that are important. A middle class, of course, is the essence and the, and the future for a country to continue to grow. But it's also uh, a population that expects more, more services, uh, more things, better education. You don't want to. You don't have to worry anymore about what you're going to eat next week. You don't have to worry about the quality of the school of your children. The, the uh, transportation, certain services, more protests, more democracy. Um, you know, at the same time, I think, I, I don't think, I know that a big reason why we achieved this milestone that I mentioned about the middle class had to do with the fact that Colombia, like many countries in Latin America, um, benefited immensely from the price of oil, the price of commodities, uh, and the growth that we all felt throughout uh, Latin America. More than 10 years of growth uh, uh, averaging 4.6% had a lot to do with it. Um, even um, uh, this was, you know, if we compare ourselves to the largest economies of Latin America, we were doing pretty well um, in terms of the average growth during all those years. Um, again, in 2017, uh, of course, things are very different. Of course, with the price of oil being what it is, uh, all the economies in Latin America are not growing at the levels that they were. Um, we expect 2% uh, growth, which, for again, for our averages and for the past few years, is significantly low. Uh, but, uh, and I know that this doesn't, doesn't help a lot when you're trying to convince uh, certain businessmen, but you have to look at the whole region and see what's happening in the whole region to get an idea that this is goes goes beyond uh, what is happening. So we are we are coming to an area after more than 15 years of much less growth throughout the whole region. Now, one of the things that um, we have uh, focused on in the government or the, uh, the government 
uh, uh, in the last six years has focused on is uh, joining the OECD. And uh, a lot of people um, are not familiar with the OECD as I think something more of interest of economists, of uh, analysts, uh, people that like handle economic data, but for Colombia, uh, joining the OECD is extremely important. It is extremely important because it is probably the best way to go before, uh, let's say, a, a, a very capable board of directors uh, that will just look at your policies and the transparency of your policies and everything. It has to do with trade, with education, with labor, with uh, uh, economic conditions, with the stock market, uh, and uh, following these recommendations, implementing the changes that the OECD uh, gives you uh, before you can be a full member of the OECD are, uh, in the opinion of uh, the Colombian government, extremely important. So we expect to be full members um, by the end of this year or the beginning of next year. And, and again, this is one of these uh, long-term investments that will, by changing the laws, by changing the structure, by opening the transparency of the companies that are owned by the state, of the practices of government in general, will make uh, 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 Colombia a much more efficient place. Another um, thing that is worth uh, mentioning is that Colombia continues to advance in the ranking for doing business worldwide. Um, even though uh, the World Bank ranking last year put us at number 54 in 190 countries, we continue to grow five to 10 uh, positions every year. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, concerted effort, and I'm sure we'll hear more in the presentation of Invest Bogota, mostly a cities-led uh, uh, effort to streamline business, to make it easier for companies to uh, get incorporated, to start functioning, to get their permits, to do their contracts, um, to rationalize you, the use of services, etc. Um, now, this is another um, uh, slide that I'd like to show uh, because if I um, if I ask people in this room if somebody has never ever heard a bad thing about Colombia, please raise your hand. <laughs> so I, I I wasn't expecting a lot of hands. Uh, but, but at the same time, even though I can, I would like to blame Hollywood and, you know, I, I was checking the cable company the other day, you know, those movies that you can rent for five dollars, there were three movies, three movies that it was like some adventure in this crazy Colombia and something goes terribly wrong, you know? And I, as a Colombia representative, get really mad with these things, but I, I, I understand that there is a lot of of history behind this and a lot of truth behind the history of Colombia, which is a history of a country with a lot of violence, especially in the last 20 years. So, Colombia paradox for me is how Colombia is the only country in Latin America that has grown economically every year, with the exception of 1999 for the last 50 years. It's the only country in Latin America that has never defaulted in its debt. It's a country that has an economic central bank that has handled its economy in a very orthodox way, uh, that is very pro-investor, but at the same time is a country with a terrible history of violence. And the chart that I, I show is, you look at the, uh, these are the, the blue line is the number of civilians that were killed in the conflict in Colombia. This is beginning uh, in 1958 when the conflict began. This is uh, the, the orange line is the, Soldiers, troops, uh, guerrillas, people that were in the fight uh, directly, and this is just the people that were involved. But then we see the GDP of the world now, um, always growing, uh, with the exception right here of 1998, the, the, the red point. And, and, and so this is, this is something that generally is difficult to understand. How can a country continue to grow economically? How can it continue slowly to grow its middle class? and have this level of violence? Well, one of the many answers, many reasons, but one of the quick ones is, first of all, that the conflict was mostly focused on the remote rural areas of the country. So you were talking about two countries. You were talking about urban centers, like Bogotá, like Medellín, like Cali, cities that were thriving, growing, people were moving to the cities. 
and the, the brunt of the conflict was really happening in rural areas. So you could do business, you could prosper, but you couldn't travel safely between cities unless you flew. This uh, was unsustainable, of course, and fortunately, things have changed significantly in that aspect, and very positively. Um, <coughs> now, um, one of the, um, the, the, for example, um, to see that there's different angles to everything. We have, we're expecting a 2% growth this year, much lower than, than, than we've had in many years. Again, for a lot of reasons, including international reasons. But at the same time, our superintendency of industry and trade just reported that last year, the largest 1,000 companies in Colombia increased their profits by more than 5%, and all of them posted record sales. Now, at the same time, the following 1,000 companies grew in 14.9%, especially the sectors of industry, construction, and agribusiness. So even during the slowdown, we see healthy growth in many aspects. Let me talk now quickly about the cost of war uh, and the peace accord. Uh, so, as I was saying and explaining in my, in my uh, chart about the paradox, we continue with economic growth and, and these levels of violence that keep growing. And so, you know, a lot of people throughout the years in Colombia have been asking themselves, well, what was the cost of war? <coughs> the cost of war is huge. Uh, one calculation puts it at 76.6 .6 U.S. billion. This is just what the government has had to spend in military expenditures and just to take care of the, of the effects of terrorism and the violence. The size of our security forces. Uh, one of the largest armies in Latin America. Um, we, uh, the second in, in Latin America after Brazil, which, and more importantly, if you look at uh, the war budget per institution every year, um, you know, there's a big debate if you've been looking at the news, uh, President Trump in the U.S. is pressuring his G7 and G20 countries to increase defense because he's saying that the U.S. shouldn't be the only country paying for, for defense. Uh, during World War II, during World War II, the U.S. was pressuring the Allies and was pressuring Canada to spend 3% of GDP. The last 25 years, they've been asking them to spend 1.5, uh, raise it to 2% of GDP, but Canada spends less than 1% in defense of GDP. Many countries in Western Europe do that. Colombia had to spend 3.4% of GDP in security, in defense. Uh, and this uh, makes it much more difficult to allocate the budget to other needs. For the last two years, for the first time in Colombia's history, or at least since records exist in the last 50 years, we spend more money in education than in security. So this is uh, what we see as the way forward and just really reallocating the very limited budget expenses that we have. Another cost is the deaths of the conflict. Uh, we think of the, of the damage in Colombia, uh, of the war, and during the really uh, ugly part of the conflict, which was between 1994 and 2004, was the majority of the murders. But over the last 50 years, since the war began with FARC and the guerrillas, 220,000 people were killed. There were reports of more than 6 million people displaced from their homes more than 27,000 kidnappings, rapes, 10,000 people, victims of anti-personnel lines. So it was a very high and unsustainable cost. Now, the government embarked in a peace agreement with FARC after uh, different governments have failed to uh, secure an agreement with FARC in more than 40 years. Uh, and the only reason that they succeeded, I think, this time, was because they, they did something that is very Canadian. They did their homework. They really studied what had happened, what had went wrong in all of this different peace process throughout the world and in Colombia. They went to Northern Ireland. They brought people from South Africa. They brought people from Yugoslavia. They spoke to many people and prepared themselves, learning from all the mistakes and all, and all the failed efforts. They secured a peace agreement that is being implemented as we speak. FARC has uh, 
um, demobilized to 23 different areas in, in the country of Colombia. This week they're laying down all the weapons, uh, which I think is a significant milestone. They have provided the GPS information for their hidden weapons in the jungle to the uh, United Nations. Uh, and they are on their path to becoming a political party. Um, this, uh, the, 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 the implementation of the peace agreement will um, take a lot of time and will be bumpy because that's what happens in all the implementations of all peace agreements throughout the world. Uh, but uh, it will allow uh, the government for Allah and Colombians opportunities to really focus on issues uh, like education, like transportation, like infrastructure, uh, like continue to increase uh, uh, our middle class. Um, as I said before, the brunt of the conflict was suffered by the most remote areas. So, one of the promises that the government did to the guerrillas when they sat down was, we are going to really transform the countryside in Colombia because that was the origin of the conflict 50 years ago. The FARC, which became a terrorist organization that committed innumerable crimes, began as a political organization, are a political organization. Their combatants received, during those 50 years, every day, two to four hours of communist indoctrination. But their main claim was land reform, was the fact that so many peasants that were pushed by the lands, didn't have property rights, and couldn't have a living in the rural areas. So the government made a very large commitment to transform this. And transforming this means that there's a lot of things to be done. Of course, you have to build roads. Easier said than done, especially to remote areas where the markets are small. You can very quickly convince large companies to build, to improve the roads between Bogota and Medellin, or to the ports, or to the large centers, because there's a market, there are tolls, there's money to be made. But invest on roads that go to very small little towns. It's like it's like it's like for Canadians when they when they have to invest in the north, in the Great North, to very small communities, very remote communities, and how expensive it is to maintain and protect those communities. So, I think I think it's a valid comparison. Um, and transforming the rural area of Colombia, Colombia, as you see in the map here, is is roughly a country which very vast and remote areas. You have to do many things. Uh, some are very popular, and some are very unpopular, and some are difficult. I think among the unpopular, I would say, probably land reform has an element that is very important. Everybody that owns a condo or an apartment in a city pays real estate taxes and has no problems with it because they know, you know, that's what you do. Uh, sadly, in Colombia, the large landowners are not used to paying big real estate taxes for their land. Practically, they don't pay, they pay very little, some do, but the, mo the majority pay very little taxes for their land. And so, there is an incentive to own un uh, uh, land that re is really not productive. For, la for, for you, as many economists and many wealthy people in Colombia have argued for decades, uh, when you know you have to pay taxes over land, you don't want to have thousands of acres with cattle grazing and you know just visiting on the weekends your farm you want a very productive uh, uh, area uh, that can export that can produce top uh, crops or cattle or 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 goats or whatever you want to do but in a very technical way because you're paying taxes and you want to do a big business out of it Colombia has a huge potential uh, in terms of the of, what we, of, of feeding a big part of the world. We have ideal climate conditions, we have lots of water, we have 24, uh, 12 hours of light every day, all year, uh, and lots and lots of arable and, and land that would be ideal uh, to build agribusiness. This is why the, the country has always thought that we should be an engine of growth in the agro industry. But again, this is a long-term project, it requires investment from the private sector, requires uh, very clear rules, and has strong opponents. Now, at the same time, we also have to put there the fact that some of those areas, with far gone, there will be other groups interested in uh, taking power there, 
in order to use it for what they do, uh, which is uh, illegal crop uh, growth and selling of narco traffickers. So the government has to provide security, economic conditions, deal with this, and deal with people that don't want to pay taxes um, altogether. What are the dividends of peace? Well, you know, um, of course, one of the things that we like to claim is that in the last two years, we've had the lowest level of homicides in 40 years in Colombia. That, I think, is a, for us, is a very important number. Um, even more so with the ceasefire with FARC, uh, the numbers continue to go down. Um, and, and this is a, a very welcome um, development. We still have to go significantly lower, as you can see. But if you look from where just, just where we started 10 years ago, where we were, and it's even higher if you go up to 2000 and 1995, um, we see the benefits. Now, look at the victims of landmines, most of which are always civilians. Um, there's a, there was a big story that we have a, a military hospital in Bogota, and for the first time in 50 years, it's empty. Uh, uh, it's practically empty. They're receiving one or two people, maybe, hit by a mine in remote areas every year, when it used to be hundreds and hundreds every year. So all of these are, are measurable benefits of, of seeking peace. Um, and, um, but it's a, it's a long process, and it, it, it's not, it hasn't been ever done overnight. Now, there's of course, there's, of course, there's a, a number of challenges uh, to this, as I was mentioning. Um, for example, um, the uh, implementation, uh, one of the most, um, one of the most uh, controversial aspects of the peace agreement is that many people uh, do not accept the fact that FARC will not face uh, prosecutions in normal courts. Um, and, and when they, when they were responsible for crimes against humanity, for genocide, for terrible crimes uh, and violations of human rights. So, and, 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 you know, the answer to that is that up until the Columbia Peace Agreement, all peace agreements in the world, all peace agreements in the world provided full blanket amnesty. You don't go, you don't negotiate with the government peace and they say, and then now I'm going to go to jail for 30 years. Uh, you generally go to jail for 30 years when they grab you alive and they take you. Governments had down the organization and for the first time had to tell them something that did not happen in South Africa or in Northern Ireland or in Yugoslavia uh, or had happened ever before in Colombia and told them, we cannot give you a full blanket amnesty. Under the international rules, under the International Court of Justice, if we do that, you will be able to be prosecuted anywhere. Uh, and we would have a lot of problems uh, with, it, with a lot of countries because Colombia would be seen as violating international law. So we will create a special legal system in which you will be, uh, uh, the people that, that are accused will be, will be prosecuted. If found guilty, they would have to serve a term in restricted locations. Um, and uh, uh, if you don't confess to any of these crimes, the, the the, uh, the years, the number of years in which uh, you could end up uh, 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 being uh, secluded or without liberty privileges could go up significantly to even 20 years, so, which is something that... Uh, uh, now, if you confess to all your crimes and provide compensation, the limit would be between four and six years of the time that you, used to, uh, you, know, you, you will pay for your crime. You will have to compensate your victims, you will have to confess, and this was done after uh, innumerable consultations with representatives of the victims in Colombia, which in the great majority of the cases always argued that for them the most important thing was the truth, finding out what happened to my father, what happened to my sister, where is she, why was she killed, that's what they, not as much as, and I want you to go to jail for 50 years. So that and the political negotiation created the system, the special <coughs> jurisdiction, uh, system, which is now being implemented, but that of course has been uh, extremely criticized by the opposition to the to the peace agreement. Another question that, that I get a lot uh, uh, is what's going to happen with the ELN peace talks. ELN is a small guerrilla group, very um, very uh, fanatic, I would say. Um, 
uh, founded by two Spanish priests uh, um, uh, in the 1960s, uh, much more uh, hier less hierarchical than FARC, uh, with their fronts in the jungles uh, that are very independent, and uh, how they have been responsible for blowing up uh, oil pipelines in the remote areas of Colombia, creating horrible uh, environmental disasters for many, many years. Uh, the government is also seeking peace with them. The government, uh, as they did with FARC, will not enter into a ceasefire and will continue to persecute anybody that violates the law as long as these uh, groups are kidnapping and committing crimes. Now, uh, so there are talks outside of the country with ELN. It's difficult to know how well they will go. They're a very extreme, smaller group. So that's a, a problem that remains. But at the same time, like many analysts say, you know, for the first time, the army is going to have time, really, to focus on them. Uh, and they know that, because they don't have to focus on the fire group, which the real big main enemy. So um, we'll see what happens there. Now, of course, as I said, enforcement of land rights, the state presence, and dealing with illicit crops will be the, on, of the other challenges that we're facing. Let's talk now about Canada and Colombia. Uh, one of the brands that uh, we've discovered that is uh, very uh, interesting in Canada is the Pacific Alliance, which is the the, um, the trade agreement between uh, Chile, Peru, Mexico, and Colombia um, that uh, is aiming for uh, creating a one single market uh, in those four countries. And uh, coincidentally, it is uh, the focus of many Canadian investors. So they are, uh, at the same time, in uh, these four countries. They see that these four countries in Latin America are among the four countries that chose a different path than many of their neighbors. They chose a path of open markets, of independent branches of government, of democracy, of uh, free trade. Uh, and <coughs> this is something that is very attractive for venture capital, and for capital uh, uh, investment that, 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 that all those countries uh, seek. Um, and, and so they've been uh, uh, among um, the countries where Canada has uh, invested the most in Latin America. Uh, and uh, there are all of the uh, economies that are doing, in average, much better than, than many others in the region. Now, interestingly, last year Canada was the largest investor, foreign investor in Colombia. Uh, this was done really uh, because there was a purchase by a, a large asset manager of a large company in Colombia, so that was the blip. But Canadian foreign investment or Canadian investment in Colombia continues every year, mostly in the extractive sector, but every time more we see it in services, <coughs> technology, uh, we see it in, in um, in more sectors financing uh, uh, that were not there before. So, so again, um, this is all going the right way. Our bilateral trade is, in my opinion, small, Consider we have a free, free trade agreement. We've had a free trade agreement for over six years now. Um, and I think that uh, in one way, even though Canadian exports have grown and Colombians keep buying more products from Canada, uh, the truth is, that in the case of Colombian exports, the Colombian exporters have been focusing more on the U.S. considering it's a, for in their opinion, considering it's a bigger market and also uh, taking into account the fact that, that it is uh, difficult for many of these Colombian businessmen to uh, travel to Canada as easily as it is to travel to the United States. Um, but again, we continue to sell our coal, our coffee, chemicals, uh, flowers, uh, and we buy a lot of grain, we buy a lot of machinery, uh, and we buy a lot of uh, 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 manufacturing products as well. Now, um, this panel was, is, uh, this, this uh, um, meeting today um, has a focus on, on, on uh, infrastructure, and I wanted to, to briefly mention a couple of things here. Um, first one is that, um, that, uh, sorry. I'm making a mess here. Um, there's a couple of, um, a 
I've been talking about this infrastructure initiative for, for a while, but uh, let me explain to me what is happening. As you knew, as I, as I mentioned, I'm very proud of the fact that my country continued to grow economically during those difficult times of high insecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that many people in Colombia recognized and knew was that the quality of our infrastructure had fallen behind and fell behind significantly. When uh, the security situation um, uh, really deteriorated in the, in the 90s, uh, all of the large international construction companies left, many international companies that had built pipelines uh, in very remote areas of Colombia, that had been involved in very large projects, they all left. Uh, and the local companies that many didn't have the capacity took advantage <clears throat> Of, uh, I mean, they, some of them did great things, and they were good, serious construction companies, but they didn't have the, uh, the financial muscle in many cases. And one thing that is endemic in, in many countries uh, that you probably have heard about that happened in Colombia as well was that the government would bid on a project, on an infrastructure project. Uh, and, you know, obviously this is public money, so we want to make sure we utilize it carefully, so inevitably, the lowest bidder would win. And almost inevitably, the lowest bidder would not finish without asking for additions and additions and additions. This has happened throughout the world. This is uh, one problem of infrastructure. It has a lot to do with regulations, has a lot to do with planning, has a lot to do with distrust of giving public money to a private company. But all of these problems <coughs> are fixed, and the government embarked on a huge transformation of the whole infrastructure uh, legal system that took many years. What would happen in Colombia, and it has happened in Argentina, in Brazil, in Mexico, even in Canada many times, was that, for example, if you knew that it, uh, one day the highway had to go through your house or through your land, you would secure that land and then you know, basically negotiate until you died uh, to get the, the largest amount of money from the government. In Colombia, like in many countries, this, this would stop a large project for years. So it, for, that's an example of giving. The government had to pass a law basically saying, once all the planning is done and the government is going and uh, building a, either through a PPP or directly, a, a, any uh, a, a public infrastructure, if Joe tells me that his land is worth 100 and I think it's worth 10, I will build the highway and I will put you know, 15 of fund and we'll go to court. Uh, but this, the, the highway or the bridge or the tunnel or the airport or the port will not be stopped. So that's one example of the many, many changes they had to do. Another one was, of course, we're not going any longer to grant the bid to the lowest bidder. We're going to give it to the company that provides the best insurance, provides the best quality, provides the best uh, coalition of expertise, and, and, and financial muscle to make sure that this is done. And we will only pay them at the end when they've actually finished what they're building. So, again, um, the government <coughs> took some money and went to the private sector and embarked in a, a very, very ambitious infrastructure uh, project um, of uh, over uh, 16 billion dollars have been already committed for this U.S. to this project, uh, and it's really uh, very slowly changing uh, the infrastructure in Colombia in a very significant way. So, and road infrastructure on um, uh, small roads that go to to not the most important areas of the country, uh, re uh, especially dredging our rivers uh, that had been abandoned for years and are an excellent way of communicating the whole country. Airport infrastructure, railway infrastructure, there's many things to be done, there's many projects and we see a very healthy appetite and interest from the private sector, including international companies from all over the world bidding, uh, entering into alliances with local companies, with other international companies, pension funds, looking at the place, replacing the financial sector that is the first lender in many of these projects. Um, and we have a number of, a, of a, uh, uh, what we call 4G or fourth generation uh, highways and projects 
that uh, have already been structured financially are under construction. Uh, we have a number that have <coughs> already been approved, have been bid, and are currently under financial uh, structuring. And uh, we combined these three waves of, of projects that the government presents to potential uh, investors with to be built and they pay by public money with PPPs um, that are becoming more and more interesting um, in, in, in different sectors. So um, the, the number that I have is that we've approved 33 of these large projects, uh, awarded 31, uh, and we have financial closures in seven. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the difficulty now is uh, or, or the challenge, I would say, is moving ahead and bringing more money uh, from out of the country to invest in these projects. Projects of uh, a large, you know, asset managers, pension funds, they like projects that are already built, that generate a toll permanently because it's, you know, it's just setting your money in a place where you expect a, a you know, nice, healthy return for a long period of time. It's much more difficult to convince those large pools of money that you need to invest in something that is being built. Again, there's also an answer for that. You can bid on projects that are partially built, already have tolls, so you have cash flow, and at the same time, you have responsibility or a project uh, to be built, and that is, that is part of what, what is being done now. Um, again, the interesting thing uh, is that because the government has been around for almost seven years, the government has learned a lot from transforming this and looking at the rules and, and, and adapting the rules. We've had a lot of people from the private sector come in, work for the government, work with the government, um, and um, uh, adapt the conditions but continue the, the, the project. Um, that pretty much covers it. Um, I thank you very much for uh, not falling asleep, and um, I hope um, and I look forward to hear from the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Duela. As always, the presentation is very interesting, very energetic, and very insightful. So we thank you. I think we have, we're very lucky. I think it's the third time that we have an ambassador in our office. Thank you. Um, is there a video? Can you represent first a video? Okay, so our next speakers are Juan Gabriel Perez Chuster. I think I hopefully I pronounced it correctly. He's executive director of Invest in Bogota. As mentioned before, it's a non for profit private public investment promotion agency and is formed by the Bogota Chamber of Commerce and the City of Bogota Government since 2013. Juan Gabriel is a trade professional with a specialization in foreign relations and negotiations and has more than 17 years experience in trade and investment promotion that began in the Colombian Ministry of Trade, Industry and Tourism. Today, Juan Gabriel oversees Bogota's strategy for foreign direct investment attraction and international positioning as one of the most attractive places for foreign business in Latin America. Following Juan Gabriel, we're going to have Juan Carlos Jimenez Tobon. He's Investment Promotion Manager for Invest Bogota, and he leads a multidisciplinary team of investment promotion officers. He's responsible for the design and implementation of the agency's investment promotion strategy with five major areas of focus, IT based services, creative industries, life manufacturing, life sciences, and infrastructure and city projects. Previously, he was involved, involved in electronic banking, commercial roles for MNC and Citibank in Colombia, and as international sales managers uh, and, and business and a business development in car graphics. Welcome both. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, good morning, Mr. Ambassador of Colombia, Nicolás Llorea. Ricaurte. I want to thank the Canada Colombia Chamber, Chamber of Commerce, Pro Colombia, Alvaro Concha in Canada, and in special Gaulen WLP uh, for the opportunity to present the business potential of the Bogota 
vision in infrastructure to Canadian companies in Toronto this morning. I would like to begin by introducing myself. I am uh, Executive Director of Bogota Investment Promotion Agency, as well as Juan Carlos Jimenez, uh, our Investment Promotion Manager, uh, with us today to share with you the latest uh, regarding infrastructure projects uh, in the city region. This is a key point during our North American, uh, North American campaign to uh, Canadian and US. Uh, we are the city's non-profit mix uh, private uh, for internet investment agency created in 2006 to promote the value add proposition of the city of Bogota and the surround province of uh, Cundinamarca for the industry sectors uh, that the city has identified as a key for employment generation and ecosystem growth. IT-based services, creative industries, life science, life manufacturing, and infrastructure and city projects. The first line of, of action of the agency, next one, uh, is the promotion of FDI. We are also uh, in charge of the city international marketing uh, strategy, as well as monitoring the current investment climate uh, of the city region. In these 10 years, uh, we have attracted over than two uh, 60 investment projects, uh, for any investment projects, uh, total uh, more than uh, 1. Point billion US dollars in estimated foreign direct investment and has created over 24,000 estimated, uh, estimated direct jobs in Bogota and its role in this surrounding. Together with helping position, uh, position Bogota internationally, uh, internationally is a center for business in Latin America and one of the best cities for doing business in the region. Invest in Bogota uh, provide uh, custom uh, made information to potential investors on business opportunities to ensure they can long list and short list in Bogota as a destination of choice for a Latin American hub and input in terms of building and potential business plan for regional uh, expansion. The agency uh, helps clients through pre-explorative uh, pre phase through in reinvestment and provide local site visit assistance uh, in meeting with academia, institutionally, vendors, value chain, and potential partners and clients. Our services are free of charge. Uh, I would like to leave with you a short video of business opportunities in Bogota and then have our investment promotion manager go over the latest advance some of our infrastructure projects. Thank you. Business, science, technology, privileged location, accessibility, innovation, Progress, creativity, culture, young talent, quality of life. This is Bogota. The central location of Bogota and the frequent direct air connections with all major cities around the world make it the ideal place to serve global and local markets. El Dorado Airport is number one in Latin America in cargo movement and number three in passenger movement. Third most important passenger hub and the largest in cargo handling throughout Latin America. It receives flights from 26 countries, 42 international destinations, with more than 700 direct frequencies and access to markets totaling more than 1.4 billion people across the world. Bogota generates about 25% of the national gross domestic product and is an outstanding player in Latin America. Bogota's GDP is higher than that of some countries in Latin America, making it one of the strongest economies in the region. It has more than 300,000 companies, source of 54% of Colombia's financial operations.
Bogota is recognized as being the fifth best city to do business, according to America Economia. It is one of the four cities of the future, and one of the top five for investment in the region. First of all, starting with the country. So Colombia is, is one of the fastest growing economies. Um, it's, an area, it's a country that has a lot of opportunity. So as we chose the countries, Colombia had to be one of the ones where we would get started. Bogota is being promoted internationally as a place for foreign investment in priority sectors that contribute to the economic development through the creation of high added value jobs and transfer of technology, manufacturing in the sectors of automotive and transportation, processed foods, construction materials, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and medical equipment, and high impact infrastructure and city projects. The most attractive thing about this city and its people, I think is that they celebrate creativity, but also business. And you also see thriving businesses that are coming out and using technology to drive totally new opportunities for people here. The greatest value of the capital region is its people. With a population of 7.9 million, more than 70% of the workforce is made up of young, highly qualified professionals. 115 higher education institutions, six of the 100 best Latin American universities, mainly in the economic and administrative sciences, social sciences, and engineering. Diversification <coughs> of industry sectors, all of those things are combining right now, along with the growing middle class and wonderfully young workforce. All these things are coming together to give Bogota some great moments. Arts capital in October. It's five festivals <coughs> and the destination as a creative city of music by UNESCO. Make it a space for expression and ingenuity. We can capitalize on the fact that there is so much growth to be had. So I think that the local market's full potential. That low back company is eclectic. Every two years, it celebrates one of the largest theater festivals in the world and is the location of major fairs, conferences, and exhibitions. Bogota is a green city. It has more than 5,000 parks, 16 wetlands, streams, and nature reserves, and 410 kilometers of bike paths and bike lanes with more than 600,000 daily trips. Every Sunday, Bogota transforms itself with a special bike path, becoming a meeting place for sports and family outings. <coughs> Continuing its impressive transformation process, the city is carrying out ambitious large-scale urban renewal programs, developing innovative mobility and infrastructure solutions aimed at turning the city into Latin America's center for knowledge and innovation. Bogota is positioning itself as the business hub of the region, a reference for the best talent and creativity. Bogota is living the change and the future, and you are a part of our transformation. That was just a brief uh, explanation of what we do with the agency. Highly recognized as one of the best investment promotion agency, agencies at regional level in Latin America mm -hmm. by international publications like uh, the Financial Times as well as uh, Site Selection Magazine and the World Bank. So I'm not going to go into in depth of why Bogota. You saw that very briefly. I want to go straight into the matter of what are some of the great business opportunities of the city, uh, not just in lifestyle as you saw here in the video, but in terms of strategic location, and that means that a company from North America can be located smack in the middle of Colombia and smack in the middle of Latin America, managing business for operations and services as well as manufacturing industry, healthcare, infrastructure, of course. 
one of the best airports in the region, ranked third in terms of passenger volume after Guadalupe in Sao Paulo and Mexico City Benito Juarez, and first in, in air cargo volume. So we saw some of the numbers of the city, I'm going to skip through these. But an incredible driver of growth in the amount of capital of the city, more than half of all financial transactions in Colombia go through uh, Bogota. All major banks, including Canadian banks, of course, have their uh, headquarters in Bogota, with the exception of Bank Colombia, the only uh, national bank with a, a headquarter outside of Bogota. And a very uh, uh, diverse, uh, diversified economy, mostly in the, in the business sectors of the economy, manufacturing, construction, transportation, and so on. You saw those numbers again. The late motif now is, if you've been to Mexico and Brazil, the place to do business in the rest of Latin America today is Bogota, larger than many of its neighboring countries. Uh, City of Human Talent, where you can find uh, more than 110,000 uh, sorry, graduates in tertiary uh, 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 universities, uh, almost 25,000 engineers and life science graduates a year, the top universities in Colombia, Universidad de los Andes on the uh, uh, private side, Universidad Nacional on the uh, national side, or local, uh, sorry, uh, public, uh, and mostly active research groups in the country. Almost half of all the PhDs in Colombia are based in Bolivia. Uh, more than half of all medium and large companies in the country are in Bogota. And in the last 15 years, we have more than tripled the number of companies with base in Bogota that have foreign capital, including Canadian, of course, and North American in general. The sources of investment, you do not see Canada here because this is mostly what we consider to be production investment. Canadian investment has been consistently more on the extractive energies. And a positive incentive uh, from a free trade zone regime standpoint is how to set up business in Bogota and in Colombia in a free trade zone, both for services as well as manufacturing and logistics, uh, where you can set up a, and have a differential income tax rate drop to 20% from a regular average tax rate of roughly 34%, no value added tax for purchases from the Colombian territory, uh, no local taxes, and the possibility not only to do maquila, import, process, and export, but the possibility you can import into the local Colombian market, which helps balance your P&L and surname. And uh, uh, imports without duties for uh, capital equipment and raw materials. Six of these major centers, and some of the most, the oldest ones, including Zona Franca de Bogotá, that just heard 20 uh, uh, this year, are located in the outskirts of, of Bogotá. Uh, this, uh, free trade zone, by the way, I worked there about 10 years ago. It used to be more like an industrial park. Today it looks more like a university. It's moved consistently from logistics and manufacturing now more into services, BPO, shared service centers. Uh, not very far from here, we have a very large shared service center for Scotiabank, 750 people manning uh, uh, operations for North America, Canada, US, as well as Latin American markets, and the project to bring that up to about 4,000 people and mirror the same center of excellence that, that uh, Scotiabank has today in uh, Toronto. Zona Franca de Cancipa and Sofrandina in the north, more logistics and manufacturing, as well as in Texona Metropolitana, the south and western side, Occidente, a little biotech, food processing, logistics, and uh, life sciences. And then you have income tax deductions. This counts if you do a run environmental projects uh, in terms of tax breaks. If you run research and development and innovation projects, and we're not <coughs> specifically talking nanotechnology here in, that, in terms of complexity, anything that improves processes in Colombia, and if it gets approved by the Ministry of Science, Conciencias, you can have a tax break there as well. Uh, for the purchase of the capital assets also, and for uh, employment of disabled uh, uh, personnel, uh, employees. Investment opportunities, huge in life sciences, services, and light manufacturing, as well as infrastructure. I run a team of 10 investment officers that basically provide day-on-day -day service to potential clients in this area. So one of the things that I want you to do after this is please contact me so I put you in direct contact with the officers that will provide you as much 
bespoke information so you can build a business plan about increasing business opportunities in Bogotá and Colombia in general. Uh, priority sectors, just a little bit more detail. In life sciences, pharmaceutical, medical instruments, cosmetics, and now health services are huge, and we have Canadian examples in some of those. Uh, technical and professional services, the PPO and KPO industry is still growing, software development, IT, and creative industries, and again, we do have very strong Canadian examples here. In light manufacturing, in processed foods and construction materials, huge opportunity for Canadian and Ontario companies. And in infrastructure and sustainable construction and city projects, as well as certain projects for logistics platforms on the outskirts of Bogota. So Bogota is a city with future, a city of psychopaths. 40 years ago, we started one of the world's first uh, uh, ciclovias. It's been uh, copied in various different other uh, geographies in the world. Our current mayor doing its first tenure, Grand Trans Milenio, which is one of the world's most important bus rapid transit systems. It runs more than 17,000 buses a day. Uh, it was built for about 1.5 or 1.6 million passengers a day, but today it's running 2.4 million. So we're actually moving now within this new tenure. Uh, uh, mayor Peñalosa is, is projecting the Metro uh, Bogotá, and I'm going to give you some more details on that. Uh, Invest in Bogotá has been very active in Transmilenio in the last three or four years in trying to improve the number of buses within the fleet that are hybrid or electric. Uh, and there will be a potential bidding process. We do not have the details yet, but by the end of this year, there might be a bidding process to replace at least 1,300 buses from the trunk areas. And these are the larger 100, 100 to 150 passenger buses within the system. Huge opportunity and potential for auto, auto parts manufacturers, the entire value add chain. Uh, in electric mobility too, we have been pioneers in Latin America. We have the second largest electric taxi pilot in Latin America after one in Mexico City with Nissan. Ours is BYD from China, Build Your Dreams, and they're running close to 45 different electric cabs today. They are starting to work with some of the local cab operators and some of these new app uh, uh, manufacturers to see if, we, if they can increase the fleet of electric cars and of course uh, electric uh, gas station, electric stations or charging stations within Bogota uh, and how that connects with the growth of Transylvania as well. Uh, in urban renewal, Centro de Convenciones Agora will be Colombia's uh, largest uh, uh, convention center uh, located between uh, downtown Bogota and the airport today. Uh, this is all, uh, an area that will have almost 800 hectares and will connect with something called uh, Centro Administrativo Nacional, UCAN, which is basically moving the back office of all the national ministries of, of, of Colombia, which are located right now in downtown Bogota. Again, in an area that is very much equidistant between downtown Bogota and the airport. And that is probably the most uh, aggressive urban renewal project in the history of Colombia, with almost 3 million square meters of potential uh, construction. 112 different buildings have to be located. The first one is in the project of structuring for tendering sometime uh, during 2018. And then you have uh, private public uh, uh, projects like uh, Proyecto Fenicia or Triangulo de Fenicia, which is the colonial hub of uh, downtown Bogota, Universidad de Los Andes, uh, organizing ur urban renewal for about 400 members of the uh, community that today has restaurants, bars, uh, photocopying centers, whatever, uh, around the, uh, the University of Los Andes, including uh, commercial space, residential, and student uh, residences. So the projects in mobile infrastructure, well, this is basically uh, the La Avenida Alo, which will be a very important trunk connecting southwest Bogota to northeast in the future, and the expansion of the entire uh, North Motorway uh, uh, roads. Uh, these are expected to be public-private partnerships, and many uh, different uh, concessions have been uh, awarded. One of them is a PPP of a combination of a Colombian and an Israeli company, and it's a railway that is, I'm oh, sorry, not a railway, a roadway uh, going south, north on the east side, on the other side of Bogota, uh, past the mountains, uh, so that heavy traffic coming from the south all the way up to the north of Colombia does not have to go through the city and reduce uh, uh, mobility, heavy traffic specifically. 
Moving to the metro. Again, I mentioned today we moved 2.4 million people on a, on a bus rapid transit or, or mass transit system that was designed for about 1.5, 1.6. So the metro people have already looked at designing at least four new lines. And the first line is something that will move not like the previous administration was hoped for as, an, as a fully underground metro for various different conditions, including a much higher cost and geographic uh, 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 soil consistency, but also because we are now moving people from the southern edge of the city where most of the, uh, the daily trips go uh, during public transportation or, or private transportation today towards the north, uh, moving east towards downtown and then uh, 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 Northway up until 127th, it will probably be increased on a third stage to Calle 170 on the northern edge of, of Bogota. For those who do not know Bogota, most of the corporate business runs in this area, north, north, south, but mostly on the north of Bogota, whereas the airport is located on this area, and most of the living and then industrial areas are it is in here. Uh, one of the things that this administration did was understand the constraints in terms of budget and timing and, and begin designing a new a, a plan for the metro, a metro that will cost anywhere between 3 and 3.2 billion USD, uh, one that will be designed in terms of the, the, uh, the uh, budget existing and how to complement uh, more infrastructure in railway or, or, or the heavy metro and a, 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 an optimized amount of buses and connectivity of buses with different stations of Transmilenium. So you have a fixed amount that you can work with. You either go fully metro or you go fully buses or somewhere in the middle. And the somewhere in the middle was the best case scenario where they looked at basically these characteristics in terms of improving the environmental impact of the city, a, the urban landscape, uh, much better user experience than Transmilenio has today, increased social benefits in, in terms of the number of trips and the, and the, and the, uh, the time that, that trips take, in terms, again, of course, of the budget and financials, and in terms of project, project risk. Uh, the Metro Bogota project begins with the approval of Empresa Metro de Bogota early last year, so now for the first time in our history, we finally have one entity designated to manage the Metro, under Andres Escobar Uribe, a person who had a, both a, a public and a private a, a background in terms of urban development and real estate development. Uh, he's managing a team together with Financiera Desarrollo Nacional who are organizing the project structuring tendering that was awarded a, last year to Sistra from France and who will be presenting, and that's something again I want you I'll, I'll push this a few different times, but I want you to keep in mind and sort of save the date around on August 29th, because that's when the studies from CSTAR will come out and many of the details of the, uh, the uh, actual project concession for the Metro of Bogota will be uh, defined. Uh, this combines with one uh, uh, important work that the previous administration led, which is a Metro, uh, sorry, a Cabia Aéreo or Aerial Cable, uh, which is a aerial cable line 3.4 kilometers in length in the southern area of Bogota it connects a community uh, that today takes about an hour and a half from up in the mountain down to the Transmilenio trunk and this will be reduced to about uh, 15 minutes so this is social mobility per se uh, in the literal sense uh, and this will connect to the, the, the new metro. And then, and I'll see a little more detail of this, Arrecho Tram, which is a, a, a mixed national, a provincial, Departamento de Cundinamarca, which Bogota is the capital of, together with Bogota, in terms of organizing not just the structuring of the project, but how this will work in, in the actual sense of the tariffs and costs to the user. Uh, it, you, it was complicated getting both a provincial and local government to talk about how this would impact and cost benefit the city or the district of Bogota compared to Cundinamarca. But the uh, latest negotiations are underway to be able to combine this eventually with the Metro Bogota project and some other infrastructure projects in the future. So again, by August of this year, we should have the CISTRA uh, uh, studies. And uh, if all goes well, the, the bidding of the first section of this metro should be around uh, Q4 of this, this year. 
If we look at the metro line, this is a metro line of 26 kilometers. So sorry, there should be 15 stations. 10 of which those stations should have direct connection with Transmilenio existing today and the new feeder system. Around, uh, around 3.5 USD billion investment, 75% of that would be building the actual viaduct or the transportation system, and about 25% will go to the feeder system. This was the kind of thing that was defined after analyzing all the best different possibilities that a metro system could have in terms of the combination of bus volume versus heavy rail traffic. Um, and in January of this year, what we have was some Consejo Nacional de Política Económica o Social or COMPES, which is sort of like a budget reservation from the Ministry of, uh, 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 of Finance, uh, in which the uh, national government commits to 70% of, of the uh, bill for the construction and operation of the metro. So with this uh, metro, what we now have is the connectivity with Transmilenio. Again, those three stages that will be built. And, and connectivity with the different phases of Transmilenio, running from a, 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 a Portal de las Americas all the way through uh, Avenida Caracas, and then up to basically the, the that core downtown a business center, Calle 72, and eventually to 127. And the third, third uh, project of that first line will probably go up to 170th Street, and then connecting a very large percentage of the daily traffic. Um, this it's going to be 100% uh, electric. Uh, it trains with up to six cars, and as you probably imagine, there are some Canadian companies already talking to uh, Metro de Bogotá and presenting. The first event we had um, was uh, two weeks ago. Uh, 90 different companies, from concessionaires, constructors, uh, uh, designers, telecommunications, railway. Um, um, uh, and, and rolling stock companies uh, came to Metro de Bogotá and invested in Bogotá and presented their wares and their lessons learned in metros, not only in cities like Hong Kong or New York or Toronto, but closer to closer down to Latin America, Panama, Quito, Lima, Mexico City, Sao Paulo. Project implementation of the sections, as I mentioned where everything depends now on the tendering process, or rather with the technical structuring and consulting to be provided by CISRA in late August, early September. We should work on the tendering, have that ready by Q4 2017, awarded approximately mid-2018. This is what, it, what is expected to be now, a U-shaped viaduct with integral stations, with a third rail electric a, a homing a, in 750 volts. Uh, almost 60,000 passengers an hour and totally driverless. Uh, the highest level of automation or automation in terms of driver uh, uh, requirements. One of the things, one of the main or most important things is what type of combination of contractual model and alternatives we have for the building of the metro and in terms of basically the infrastructure building, the rail and control systems, the rolling stock, who will manage operations and maintenance, and certainly the constructions of the stations. As it stands today, and this should be defined in the, in the coming two weeks, uh, it looks like the best alternative is to have a turnkey operation that manages four of these and leave the stations to uh, concessions to privateers, which might be an interesting opportunity, again, also for Canadian companies. All of these actually are interesting opportunities in all, in all uh, degrees for uh, uh, companies from Canada. This is general project schedule to date. So again, uh, by the end of this year, we should have the tendering process running through, and then the bidding and, and contracting and legal and awarding sometime in mid-2018, almost a year from now, is what we're expecting. And what, what's going to happen now is, will this be a concession? Will this be public works? Will this be turnkey? Or will this be tendered in different, in different sections? Uh, a little bit more detail uh, in terms of the uh, longitude, uh, number of stations, exchange stations, distance between stations, trains, <coughs> the different stages. And the investment 
a budget as it stands right now, roughly three billion USD, but obviously this can increase uh, for various reasons once the structuring is provided in August, notwithstanding uh, currency exchanges. That's both USD and Colombian peso. What we have now is a model design where there are two potential options. One, splitting up all several contracts. And option number two, a single contract. Uh, the analysis is basically a consequence of what has been learned today by Metro de Bogotá in terms of best case experiences, obviously working under the Colombian legal framework, and then what is risk distribution between the different models, the turnkey and uh, the uh, uh, separate contracts. So the first option is where you have rolling stock specifications, electromechanical equipment, communication system, and technical assistance. All of this under a, 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 a one one different a, a, a contract. Then you have civil work construction of both track and stations for both both uh, early segments, operation and maintenance, and collection. And the second model, turnkey, where you have all of these combined, including civil work construction, rolling stock specifications, electromechanical, and then obviously operation and maintenance. All of these are interesting in both considerations as far as we've been talking to a, a, a Canadian or North American companies in general. A, this is a, a, a process that is very open internationally unlike some other processes for metro construction in Latin America in the past few years, we want this to be multidisciplinary geographically. So we're looking at also in inviting Asian manufacturers and constructors, a European, North American, Latin American. This was the seminar that we ran eight weeks ago uh, on four different themes. It was four days of uh, June 6 through 9 where we were looking at the details of civil engineering, rolling stock, equipment and telecommunications, and services. And again, this was the important one, the second annual foreign direct investment meeting in around August 31st and September 1st. This is an important save the date if you want to be on the ground when uh, the latest information on the uh, financial structuring project comes about. Uh, other projects that are running through in the city. Uh, our a, a traffic light intersection system is 30, 40 years old, and we need to bring this up to date. Uh, there is a budget of close to 80 million USD uh, for somebody willing to uh, design, install close to 1,500, uh, or, or lighting systems for close to 1,500 intersections, as well as a, control, a centralized control system, electric backup, monitoring cameras and intersections and so on, and of course the PMO as well as Interventoria or the, the civil engineering oversights. Uh, this is something that will probably be tendered by uh, late this year as well. The Reto Tram, which is this regional train that will take people from a dormitory city on the southwest of Bogota Estación in Facatativa, and will run through for about 44 kilometers all the way to downtown Bogota, Estación de la Semana, and stop at the airport. Uh, it'll serve five different municipalities of Bogota with about 71.5 million passenger volume a year. Uh, it's a project of about 1.5 billion, and this will probably be tendering late 2018. Obviously, this will include construction, maintenance, operation. It will be run on royalties. Another important project in Bogota is Airport El Dorado Dos. Uh, our airport was totally revamped four and a half, five years ago. International terminal, domestic terminal about three years ago. Uh, it's already running, a, 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 I would say, a overbooked. Uh, so there is a new project under the Agencia Nacional de Infraestructura together with the Civil Aviation Authority uh, to grow into a new airport called El Dorado Dos, a new airport that, according to studies run so far, will probably more, be more of a low-cost airline uh, model uh, to be built uh, in, in the municipalities of Mosquera and Funza, oh, Mosquera Madrid, sorry. 
uh, and we'll have to connect with that regional tram uh, through to the new airport and consistently allow for the growth in the, and expansion of air traffic through our uh, uh, busiest airport yet. Uh, in PPPs, this administration started in 2016, including a, 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 the possibility of public-private partnerships for the construction, retrofit, and maintenance and operation, up to including the possibility of, of health service provisioning for six uh, uh, hospitals, uh, Bosa, La Felicidad, Usme, Simón Bolívar, Santa Clara, y Materno Infantil, uh, approximately 2,000 beds among all of these, roughly 300, 350 each. Um, uh, there was uh, a bidding that just went through, was awarded to uh, Curry and Brown from the UK for the financial structuring process for these six hospitals. Again, this would be interesting at a PMO level as well as construction and, and, and maybe for a Canadian company that wants to run, operate and maintain a health infrastructure also. And Proyecto Administrativo CAN, again, one of the most, the largest urban renewal projects in Latin America. Uh, this is totally uh, private in terms of the business uh, uh, model, or, or rather, public private with the business model of having public bi uh, 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 construction infra infrastructure being built by privateers and then using commercial spaces and residential areas to pay off for it. Uh, this could be a PPP and you know with a reversal after 21 years or so operation and maintenance uh, very very large in terms of a capex uh, no, no less than 138 million I think it could be up to 112 different buildings to be built in the Salitre area in the middle of, Bo of, Bo of the growth of Bogota and very close to the airport and central to downtown as well uh, other smart city projects there is the possibility for a unique platform for all public patient medical records. Today, every district hospital has its own system. There has to be some sort of unification. This will probably run a early 2018. I mentioned the street lighting project. There is urban renovation potential in the historical center. The National Museum is a project that might be coming through uh, next year. Thanks to I mentioned this as well. And there is the possibility of improving and bringing up to date marketplaces in Bogota to create tourist destinations out of what are traditional marketplaces in Bogota. Uh, the public-private partnership for health, uh, for health, this is key, again the new hospitals that I mentioned, and in mobility, the growth in Transmillennium, the corridors, uh, especially to the west, uh, two logistics platforms that we are bringing up to pre-feasibility, uh, pre and in fact uh, that team was under invest in Bogota just uh, about two months ago, uh, two large logistics cross-docking stations for the 18-wheelers coming into Bogota, one receiving in the south in Suacha, one on the western side uh, that connects more towards the northern ports. As you probably know, Colombia, we have ports both on the Atlantic and the Pacific, and there is a huge amount of cargo passing through those uh, logistics. Uh, logistics platforms are key in making sure that they don't impact uh, uh, transportation. And then there is also a security command and public control center for surveillance, homeland security that is being worked on. Uh, it's a little bit more closed doors today because of security reasons, but it will probably be an interesting uh, proposition for technology companies from Canada and North America in general. These are some of the, pro some of the events that we've been pushing with uh, Secretaria de Salud for the, uh, the PPPs, with Cundinamarca for the Regiotram, with the Bogota Metro that I mentioned, and with road infrastructure that will probably begin later on this year with the Instituto de Desarrollo Urbano, which is sort of like the construction and design side of uh, the city. And that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sure you guys are going to be very busy after the, the event with lots of questions. So we, we're a little bit running behind. We're going to talk very briefly, very, sh I'm sorry, very soon to our panelists. Um, and I'm going to introduce my partner, Ted Betts. Just for you who don't know, Gallons WLG, our firm, is a law firm. It's a Canadian law firm that is a global law firm with more than 1,400 lawyers 
in 18 cities around the world. We're primarily focused on industries. And one of the industries that we focus very much is, and where we have significant expertise, is the infrastructure industry. So what that means is that we're a full service law firm, but we have expertise that actually can cover and definitely advise on all of the aspects relating to any specific industry infrastructure or energy, for example. We cover all aspects of energy, uh, life sciences, natural resources, etc. So Ted Bet who's my partner, he's the head of infrastructure and construction group for, for, for Gallon WDLG. Ted is a certified, a certified specialist in construction law and is an expert with more than 20 years of experience in large-scale construction, P3 infrastructure and development projects that span from energy, renewable, and nuclear, oil, and gas, uh, infrastructure and social community development, among others in projects around the world and in Latin America. Ted currently sits as the Vice Chair of the, Executive of, the, uh, of the Executive of the Construction Law Section of the Ontario Bar Association, and he's also the Chair of the Construction Lean Act <coughs> Subcommittee of the Ontario Bar Association Construction Infrastructure Executive. Ted is going to be our moderator, and he's going to introduce our panel. Thank you, Ted. Thank you very much, Franz. I thank everybody for arriving. And in joining us today. Um, that was some great presentations. Clearly, clearly a lot of opportunities in Colombia. Um, and they're not just uh, they're not just in the future. They are projects on the ground right now, great opportunities for Canadians. And we're going to speak with our panelists who are there now, Canadians who are working in uh, and on projects in Colombia. So I uh, will welcome them up. Um, first, uh, we'll have uh, Tori McKillop, uh, Director Emerging Markets at Elliston. Um, Carl Pierce, Global Director, Investment and Business Planning at Hatch. John Sebastian Chabon, uh, Regional Manager, South America and Caribbean, uh, Caribbean at uh, Export Development. Sometimes we feel the, the coffee is not enough to wake everybody up, so we'll <laughs> perk you up somehow. And then uh, lastly but not least, um, Juan Jimenez, uh, Senior Portfolio Manager, International Equities at PSP Investments. Thank you very much. So as, as Franz mentioned, we're, we're a little behind schedule, but I'd like to take the time to take advantage of, of our speakers here because they really have the real life experience of Canadians going down successfully into Colombia and taking advantage of these many opportunities. And so we'll, if, if it's okay, we're going to push past a little bit uh, our time. I will have some questions for our panelists, but I hope uh, that we can engage the audience with some questions as well and that we can get some feedback on some of the questions that you have. And, and of course, you're welcome to stay behind afterwards to, to ask questions for those who can, can remain. So I'll start it off. Uh, we'll, we'll speak to, um, I'll start off with Tori perhaps, but, uh, and then follow along the table. Um, and if you could tell us a bit about what projects you're working on now in Colombia. Why did you consider going into Colombia as opposed to anywhere else in the world? Uh, and how did it happen? And how did you get it for you? Sure. Thanks, Ted. Um, I really appreciate being here today. When I look back at um, how Elliston started in Colombia, I, I really see dots. And uh, I can really only connect those dots in hindsight. It was not a clear path. Um, and to be honest, the first dot is probably in 2004 with the advent of the Canadian P3 economy. And that really um, enabled Elliston to become more than just a general contractor, but rather a construction services company. Because we realized that we really needed to be able to provide cradle to grave services in order for our projects to be a success. So then if you fast forward almost 10 years, um, in fact, there was a, a conference um, in Chile, and uh, we were in Chile chasing quite a few P3 projects. And there was a chance meeting between our um, center of excellence um, gentleman, Lloyd Keller, who's our concrete specialist and our now partner in, uh, in Colombia, ARPRO. And they got to talking about this challenging new project that ARPRO was going to be going after, the Atrio Tower. And um, they really 
were just asking for our advice on, on how they might build this 43 tower building and then fast forward a little bit further, six months, we were suddenly in partnership with our pro in a, in a construction management role. So that's really how um, Alistair got started in Columbia. It wasn't a targeted market per se. We were really focused on Chile. Um, and, uh, and there you go. <laughs> Maybe we'll ask uh, Carl to comment on how Hatch, what Hatch is doing and how you got down there as well. Sure. Um, so Hatch uh, started looking at Colombia, I guess, uh, a few years back, uh, four or five years back. We saw, we saw important opportunities in some of the key sectors served by Hatch, particularly mining, um, a strong project pipeline in Colombia, very competitive operating costs and therefore growth in the industry as well as an in infrastructure uh, we saw a lot of opportunities uh, especially in light of the uh, successful TPP programs uh, sponsored by the government so we started the search for a uh, local firm that would have a strategic fit with Hatch um, and identified a company in Medellin uh, in Visa in, uh, in Medellin uh, we started working with them um, through joint venture agreements first, um, you know, executing projects together to get to know each other, uh, make sure that was fit, and then uh, entering into a formal due diligence process in 2015. Uh, I was responsible of that process. Uh, I was based in Santiago in the Chilean of Hatch at the time. Uh, and in 2016, we materialized the acquisition of Indisa in, in Medellin. Uh, since then, we've been uh, integrating. It's been a successful integration uh, of the two companies. We're now working for clients globally uh, out of Medellin. Um, key projects we're working on right now, uh, just to just to name a few, are um, um, projects for EPM and Pesas Publicas, uh, the Medellin. Um, Indisa has also a strong background on light industry. Uh, we're doing work for. Uh, Grupo Agros, uh, Cement, uh, FEMSA, the largest uh, franchise Coca-Cola bottler in the world, uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, across Latin America, out of Medellin, we uh, support Procter & Gamble in the expansion of, uh, of their uh, processing facilities across the region. So it's been quite a successful integration uh, uh, for us uh, so far. Great. Maybe Juan, you can tell us about this. Sure. So, uh, I think PSP has been quite uh, positive about <coughs> Colombia for, uh, for some time. We we started uh, investing in Colombia in 2008 uh, through our uh, real estate uh, group. Uh, the initial investments we made, we made together with our partner in Colombia, which has been so far Bank Colombia, one of our main partners there. We created the Fondo Immobiliario Colombia, which is a real estate fund where uh, <coughs> the bank contributed their, you know, their branches and some real estate assets we contributed capital. That fund has been running and it still runs today, and uh, we continue to be uh, quite interesting expanding the breadth of, of that fund. On top of that, we also partnered with a local developer uh, called Amarillo, where we initially invested in projects directly uh, with them. So we provided the capital, they took care of uh, construction activities uh, across, you know, mainly, um, uh, mainly for residential projects. And more recently, we have uh, increased uh, our partnership with them by taking a direct uh, position and becoming a direct partner uh, at, the, at, the, at the holding level. More recently, uh, at the public markets level, uh, we have been very active in Colombia. We are currently one of the major shareholders in the, one of the main oil producers uh, in the country. And as well, we're increasing investments across a variety of sectors, mainly on the consumer side. Uh, we are uh, you know, quite optimistic about uh, the fundamentals, the dynamics, the macroeconomics, the demographics, as well as uh, many other uh, important things that for the public markets are uh, quite important, in particular, uh, the very strong independence of the central bank. I think we, we have actually seen that in a period of kind of uh, difficult political uh, uh, movements, and the central bank has been very, very strong, which for us is a, obviously a critical, uh, a critical element uh, to deploy capital uh, in a country. Overall, I think we have invested somewhere in the region of $400 million in Colombia. We continue to be 
quite active uh, in the country and looking forward for uh, increasing our, our stakes there. That's great. That's great. Now, Jean-Sebastien, Jean -Sebastien, um, PDC plays a slightly different role um, in facilitating helps Canadian businesses grow abroad. Can you tell us a bit about what you're doing in, in uh, Colombia and how you're helping Canadian businesses grow in the, in the sector? Thank you, uh, Ted. Uh, indeed, uh, for, for EDC, as Canada's export credit agency, uh, Colombia is a very important and growing market uh, in the Americas. Uh, we've had an office uh, in Bogota since 2013. And uh, last year, I'm very pleased to say that we had our biggest year ever. Uh, we supported $1.7 billion of business, out of which was $1.1 billion of financing. Uh, so, so very happy about that. Uh, and we see a lot of opportunity going forward. Um, one of the big deals that we supported last year was alluded to by the ambassador in his presentation. The largest uh, investment was by a Canadian company in Brookfield. Uh, who bought, along with its partners, uh, one of the largest power generator companies in Colombia, Isagen. Uh, they generate about 20% of the power in Colombia. Uh, they have the, high, uh, the biggest uh, hydro power plant as well. So, so very happy about that. Continue supporting investments into the market, as the ambassador alluded to uh, as well. Canada is one of the strongest investors uh, in Colombia. Uh, over the last uh, few years, and initially as EDC was building its business, we supported a lot of investment in the oil and gas sector. Uh, three main companies we supported, Catacal Energy, uh, Pyrex Resources, uh, as well as Gran Tierra Energy. So three companies out of Calgary uh, that made early investments that, that have provided very good returns for, for these companies. So, so very happy about that. Um, and since then, uh, in the last few years, uh, we've, we've been focused on diversifying that portfolio uh, into the infrastructure sector. Uh, I think the presentations were very comprehensive this morning, illustrating the uh, substantial opportunities uh, in the infrastructure sector, uh, whether it's in the road, the port, uh, uh, infrastructure space. So, so that's really something that we want to continue to support. Uh, how do we support uh, different ways? Uh, we're building relationships with some of the key players in, uh, in <coughs> Colombia uh, in the infrastructure space, uh, you know, whether uh, EPM, uh, EEB, uh, ESA, so that we can position our, our Canadian companies with uh, these larger multinationals. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we provide some, some financing uh, capacity to these companies and therefore this helps us engage with these companies so that we can help any companies enter their supply chains. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, through matchmaking activities, uh, through uh, introductions, uh, through missions. Uh, EDC has been organizing uh, a lot of outbound inbound missions uh, in the infrastructure space, uh, smart grid area as well. Uh, each year, actually, we do an infrastructure mission in three cities, Bogota, Medellin, and Barranquilla. Uh, it's a full week. Uh, we're doing it again this year for some of you. Uh, a little plug here. <laughs> they may be interested in, in participating. It's uh, the last week of November, uh, and this culminates with the largest infrastructure congress in Colombia that takes place in Cartagena, the National Infrastructure Congress. So if you're interested, I invite you to uh, come and speak to me at the end. I'd be glad to share more details. So uh, uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Sorry if I'm taking a bit more time here. Uh, but the P3 space, which was mentioned by Tori, uh, Canada is very strong. And we've been working closely with some of the Colombian authorities, such as the FDN, the Financiera de Desarrollo Nacional, uh, a financial institution that wants to help infrastructure companies. So we've been working closely with them to introduce them to the key players in, in Canada, such as Infrastructure Ontario uh, and others. We do see a lot of capacity building opportunities in that space and supporting our companies. That's, that's great, that's great. Um, so we, you've, in, you've each talked about some of the opportunities that you're pursuing now and some of the opportunities down the road that you're looking at. Uh, Maybe just briefly, I'm throwing this at them, I didn't get prepped them on this question, but what do you, what do you think some, some of the advantages are for you as Canadian businesses going into Columbia um, that we have here 
uh, that puts us in a better position than other companies around the world doing it in a country like Colombia. I can start. Um, I think one thing that Alistair is very excited about um, that the Colombian market is going to provide it is the P3 opportunity. We've had a lot of success, um, specifically in social infrastructure. Um, I know that there's a big push for transportation right now, um, but I mean the the six hospitals are obviously something that we're certainly tracking and excited about. But I think um, although we are very excited to be a Canadian company operating in Colombia, the biggest um, hurdle um, or <coughs> obstacle that we need to overcome is we certainly need to work in partnership with somebody that's local. We don't pretend to understand the Colombian market. Um, we are certainly learning it, um, but it would be foolish of us to, to go forward on such an initiative with, with such high risk without operating with someone locally. So I think that's Alice Dawn's takeaway is that you know there's a P3 opportunity, but we need to find local partners um, through the help of EDC and, and others um, who are going to work alongside Elliston and, and bring those projects across the line to success. And do you work with other Canadian companies you've done other P3 projects with? Do you try to bring some of them on because you, you work with them in a team or is it, is it really just the local business? I think that Elliston is able to operate in, in all three boxes of a, of a P3 equity, design, build, and, and facility services, and we would love to partner with someone locally um, to, to tap into their local expertise. Others, Juan or Carl? Uh, sure, I mean, uh, I, I share the view. We, we have the fortune of having two very good partners uh, in Colombia, uh, which help us you know, deploy capital in the better way. I think. Uh, the, the, the advantage, I guess, we have as an organization is that we're long-term investors. We have a long-term capital. Uh, in fact, we won't have any outflow of money from our funds for the next uh, 20 years. So that gives us a long-term perspective. And, uh, and these slides that our ambassador shared with us on the long-term trend, we can sustain those investments uh, throughout time. I think that's, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the key advantage that we have. But as I said, for us, we cannot claim to the only contributors to capital we need to deploy the relationship and deploy you know, long-term good, uh, let's say, marriages with our partners that will guarantee that over the long term uh, we can successfully you know, achieve a good return for our pensioners. Great. Carl, advantages yeah. for Hatch being a Canadian company? Yeah, yeah um, we certainly see the synergies. Uh, we've, we've identified that local partner and it's, we've been leveraging the local presence. Um, they are an established um, 300 people company um, providing services in Medellin um, and, and they <coughs> operate in industries that are quite synergistic I guess with, uh, with the key sectors uh, for Hatch that, for that Hatch serves. Um, um, prior to that um, Hatch had Worked in Colombia, particularly in the mining uh, in the mining sector, uh, with uh, Cerro Matoso um, um, for former BHP and now uh, sub 32, um, and and obviously with all the changes that have been um, uh, referenced for uh, happening in the country, we see we see lots of opportunity. We see lots of opportunity also in the mining sector beyond beyond the traditional um, nickel and beyond the traditional coal sectors. Uh, lots of opportunity on coal too, um, um, coming from quite uh, competitive operations. Uh, as, as we know, <coughs> 7 to $8 a ton cheaper than Australian coal and with the expansion of the Panama Canal, um, um, Colombian coal is entering into Asian markets um, only last year. Uh, coal exports had increased by 16, 17 percent, um, uh, driven by um, new Asian markets. Uh, we also see the government support in the mining industry uh, with the uh, list of um, projects uh, of national interest, um, and also the government initiative to formalize um, artisanal or illegal um, uh, gold mining, which is is quite heavy in Colombia. 80% of the gold output in Colombia is, is by, uh, by artisanal um, uh, producers, I guess. And, and that's, that's 
you know, kind of the DNA of Hatch mining and metals. Uh, so we certainly see uh, the leverage there. And then on the infrastructure, really, it's, it, it's been said, um, uh, what's happening in Colombia is quite remar remarkable from an infrastructure point of view. The 4G uh, program that was presented before uh, by the ambassador, you know, those 33 projects, 10 of which have entered into construction actually, uh, and seven, as the ambassador said, have seven additional ones have, have reached financial close. So certainly an active market on an infrastructure, uh, from an infrastructure point of view, where, where Hatch also has a lot of experience um, globally, and, and, and we're, we're hoping to um, uh, play in that market. That's great. Um, we are we are running over time, but I will take a moment maybe to ask if anybody did have any questions for our great panelists here in their experience in taking their businesses or facilitating Canadian businesses to go down to Columbia. I don't know. Anybody any questions questions at this point? No? Oh, oh I've got one at the back there. Sure. I, I just have a question about the artisanal mining. I was wondering if anyone set up mills so that uh, Artisanal miners don't, don't use, uh, let's say, very environmentally unfriendly methods for, for, for separating the deep work from the gold. Yeah, it's, um, it's quite a challenge um, given the, like I said, the volume uh, uh, of artisanal mining in the gold industry. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, the, the uh, problem here, the, the big issue is that, um, as, you, as you said, they don't use uh, traditional methods and they uh, produce uh, significant environmental issues and contamination. And that's really, in the local communities, uh, a very bad perception towards mining. To the point where what we saw last year, you know, a municipality, I think municipality voted against mining and then this, the constitutional court supported that vote um, which, which created that uncertainty of who has the power to, um, to provide um, uh, mining permits, uh, the federal government or the, or the local government or the municipal um, government and then caused one of the significant coal projects, La Colosa, right, from Andrew Olashanti to actually stop. Um, and, and it's really um, uh, causing that, that problem of bad, bad perception. And, 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 and the challenge is how to formalize that sector, how to bring better practices. Mm -hmm. And the government is playing a, a, a big role in that. Um, so that the community's perception towards mining is, is um, is, you know, improves and then allows the large-scale mining and the large-scale mining companies, particularly old mining in Colombia, to proliferate. Um, I don't, I don't, I guess, have the um, uh, answer as to, you know, how how to deal exactly with the issue. I think, I think the government is taking the right steps. Um, the federal government is taking the right steps in terms of formalizing them, and, and then the companies also have to do their share. There's plenty of positive examples around the world on how mining companies can actually um, deploy their processing and beneficiation uh, methods in an environmentally friendly way and align with the local community. Okay, I think uh, given that it's, we're after 10.30 now, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I thank the panelists tremendously for, for your input and information in the way. Um, feel free, anybody, to approach any of them or any of the panelists, uh, speakers you've, you've uh, heard from today, or Fonce or myself uh, to talk about uh, opportunities and, and ways we can, any of us can uh, help you or, or uh, based on our experience and, and skills in, in the region. Uh, can help you start your business there. We've heard a lot about the opportunities. There's clearly a tremendous amount of opportunities. Canada is uniquely positioned to take advantage of those, either because we've got a great relationship with the Canada uh, Columbia Chamber of uh, uh, Commerce and Trade, uh, or Trade and Investments, right? and, um, and with, with organizations like EDC who are there set up to help Canadian businesses grow and thrive in the world. 
Um, so at this point, I'd like to thank um, our, our speakers, in particular, His Excellency Nicholas uh, Laredo Cuarto, uh, the ambassador, um, our speakers uh, from Invest Bogota, uh, Juan Gabriel and Juan Carlos, thank you. Um, our panelists, our great panelists, um, and their experiences here, um, Tori, Carl, Juan, and uh, Jean Sebastian, um, and our co hosts, uh, Andreas uh, Trevino from the Canada Columbia Chamber of Investment and Trade. Um, I understand that uh, there are some opportunities for one on one meetings with our guests. Um, if, you, if you are interested in speaking about the opportunities directly with the Chamber, uh, Andreas is here, and, and our guests from from uh, Invest Bogota are, are here and, and they're going to setting up meetings to talk about uh, specific opportunities that might be great for your organization. Um, and thank you as well to France who helped organize this. Uh, she's the co-leader of our Latin America practice. Um, and thank you all for coming.